please welcome the Vice President of Global Patient Research and Accent of Tilray, Mr. Philippe Lucas. Thank you. Thank you all so much. It's a real pleasure to be here. I want to thank uh, uh, Fernando and Laura, all of the folks who've put on this amazing conference. I have to say, my first time in Lisbon was, was, uh, <laughs> was last year and uh, for this conference, and I was blown away not only by the beauty of the city, the amazing people around here, uh, the incredible work of the patients uh, here in Lisbon, and, uh, and this conference, which has become one of my favorite conferences uh, uh, of the year. And so it's on my schedule already for next year. I'm just letting you know whether there's a speaking spot or not, Laura. So uh, first of all, uh, I'd like you all to read this. I'm going to step out of the room for 15 minutes. Come back, there's a short test. This just basically means you shouldn't make any investment decisions based on my uh, presentation today. Uh, today I'm going to start out with a brief introduction to Tilray, which is uh, uh, Portugal's first licensed production uh, uh, company. Uh, I'll talk about medical cannabis in Canada. We'll talk about the Tilray Research Program and go over some of our clinical and observational research. And then I'm going to share some data from the largest prospect of study of uh, medical cannabis uh, patients in Canada to date. Um, and I'm going to end with a short video about one of our patients, uh, Brayden, who's a young man who benefited from the use of cannabis. I've been involved in medical cannabis now for over 20 years. I started out as a patient in 1995. I became a patient advocate and a medical cannabis provider, uh, which I did so from 99 to 2009. Um, and the one thing that I've learned now that I've been a patient researcher for 15 years is almost everything that we know about medical cannabis, we know because patients have shared their stories with us. And as an academic, as a researcher, science is just trying to catch up to what patients have been sharing for so long. We don't know about cannabis being a treatment for pediatric epilepsy because of some mice model or some preclinical research that's been done somewhere. We know because patients and families shared their stories, and now we're doing research to catch up to what we've heard from that patient experience. So for me, it all starts and stops with the patient experience. And so I'm going to end today with a short uh, movie of one of our patients. I want to start out by saying that medical cannabis is a growing uh, phenomenon. So right now there's medical cannabis regulations in 41 countries around the world uh, across five continents. A global CBD is in over 50 countries and recreational global adult use is in Canada and Uruguay. Ultimately, the thing that I want to convey from this is this is not going away. Uh, medical associations, countries, physicians need to get on the right side of history of this um, because medical cannabis is growing, it's being recognized, it's being used by more and more patients, and it's not just going to fade away, it's not a fad, it's becoming a, a more traditional now part of the pharmacopoeia, uh, pharmacopoeia as it was over 100 years ago. Uh, at Tilray, we truly are a global pioneer in medical cannabis. We were the first company to receive a cultivation license in multiple countries, Canada and Portugal. We were the first to achieve GMP certification. GMP stands for Good Manufacturing Practices. That means that all of the medicine produced by Tilray is produced at the same high standard as medications you'd find in your pharmacy or in your drug cabinet at home. Uh, we were the first to export cannabis from North America into the, into the European Union, Australia, South Central America, and most recently, we've exported cannabis into the U.S. for clinical research as well. Um, we were the first to, uh, uh, to supply clinical trials all over the world in, five con or in uh, three continents and to recruit a majority uh, woman board of directors. We're very proud of that because if you look around at a cannabis conference, you see a lot of male executives a lot of the time, and I think it's time we, we really worked on gender balance in this industry as well. Um, and, uh, and ultimately, I want to show you guys that uh, this is where our cannabis is, is mostly produced right now. It's in uh, Nanaimo in British Columbia. We have production facilities in Ontario as well. And here we have our production facility in Portugal. Right now, all of our export products are really coming from uh, Canada, but this year, earlier this year, we did our first export from Portugal to Germany for the German Medical Cannabis Program, and by this time next year, all of our non-Canadian, non-North American cannabis products will be produced in Cantanied right here in Portugal. We couldn't be more proud of that. Uh, it's been a, a great working with the, uh, with the people of uh, Cantanied on this as well.
Uh, Portugal really is an er, er, international hub. We have over 200 full-time staff there. And I have to say, uh, I've been to all of our production facilities. It's my favorite. It's very pretty. It's a lovely place to grow, and the people of Cantanieta have been amazing. And it's been great to be able to provide good jobs uh, in the cannabis industry. And I want to tell any young academics, any young students here today, that there is a future in cannabis work, research, if you're a physician, if you're uh, a psychologist, if you're uh, a biologist, uh, if you're a, pharma a pharmacologist, please consider cannabis as a potential job opportunity because we need some good, smart, uh, intelligent people coming into this field as well. Um, we really are a trusted partner in legitimizing medical cannabis. We've got 10 clinical trials that I'll tell you a little bit more about uh, in terms of partnerships with academic institutions. And we have a lot of pharmaceutical partners, and our primary partner is Sandoz, which is the generic division of Novartis. We're the first medical cannabis company in the world to have a relationship with a traditional pharmaceutical company, and that helps raise the confidence of physicians, patients, pharmacists. Uh, when they see that we're tied to a pharmaceutical company, they start to consider this not an alternative therapy, but a mainstream therapy. And our thesis at Tilray, our theory is that this is a mainstream medicine being used by mainstream patients. We're doing all we can to make sure that's the way it's looked at all around the world. Um, this is a quick look at some of our products at Tilray. I just wanted to share this to understand what our research is focused on. We have flower products, capsules, and drops as well. And the first number is always the amount of THC or the ratio of THC in the products. And then the second number is CBD. And we know that this can be tricky and so in most jurisdictions, our CBD products are in blue, our THC products are in orange, and our balanced products, THC and CBD, are in silver. We know that cannabis seems complicated, and we're doing our best to simplify it and to be as transparent as possible uh, when purchasing cannabis products so you know what you're using. And this right here, for example, is 2 milligrams of THC per milliliter and 100 milligrams of CBD per milliliter, um, which is the highest CBD product available right now in Canada. And we know that there's concerns over safety of cannabis. So I want to share with you guys, in looking at our patient use of cannabis around the world, we've collected so far 10,000 years of patient data. So that means more than 10,000 patients, but overall we've got 10,000 years of patient data. And in all of those years, we've got 74 minor adverse events. We've had 12 physician visits associated with our products. We've only had one serious critical hospitalization, which was a patient who was allergic to the oil, not to cannabis, but the oil in which the cannabis uh, uh, was uh, contained. We use uh, uh, coconut oil or grapeseed oil for our products around the world. And so this is a remarkable safety profile for a drug being used by tens of thousands of patients around the world. And I want to tell you a little bit about the history of medical cannabis in Canada for two reasons. I'd love for you to learn from what we've done well in Canada and to be able to move Portugal forward. But more importantly, I'd like you to learn by what we did wrong in Canada because we've had a medical cannabis program now for nearly 20 years, and it has not always been uh, very, uh, it hasn't been a great program for patients for much of that period of time. So Canada was one of the first nations in the world to have a medical cannabis program, but it didn't come about because our government decided to do something good for patients. It came about because patients started getting arrested for using medical cannabis, and two patients, a gentleman named Terry Parker, affected by MS, and a gentleman named Jim Wakeford, who had HIV AIDS, they fought the government all the way up to the highest courts in Canada, and in a decision in 2000, the courts decided that Canadians had a constitutional right to access medical cannabis. And they said to the government, you now have to create a pathway for safe access for patients. So the government didn't want to do this. They got pulled into it kicking and screaming. And they eventually launched in 2001 the Medical Marijuana Access Regulations, uh, or MMAR. And for the first 10 years of this program, it really was a disaster. Um, it was sued over 300 times by patients. It was found unconstitutional on at least 10 occasions as well. Um, and there were 
it was an incredibly onerous application process. I was one of the first legal patients in Canada. My first application was 33 pages long. I sent it off to the government. It took 18 months for the government to process that application. And so if you were a terminal patient, if you only had a few weeks or a few months to live, there was no way you could use cannabis legally in end-of-life treatment. It, the bureaucracy made that impossible. There was a lack of, of uh, uh, product selection. There was only one strain available uh, from one company for all Canadians. And if that strain didn't work for you, who cares? Didn't matter. There was no other legal option. Uh, and the, the strain itself was very poor quality, full of sticks and seeds. And that's what they sent out to patients. And fewer than 10% of patients actually used that cannabis, despite the fact it was subsidized by the government because it was su such poor quality. So a few years ago, about six years ago, the government, after multiple lawsuits, decided to change the program. And they put in place what we have now, the ACMPR, the Access to Cannabis for Medical Purposes Regulations. And it's been much improved. So now we have 350 or over 350,000 Canadians who have the right to access medical cannabis, who are part of our federal medical cannabis program. What's even more exciting is that there's over 18,000 physicians have prescribed cannabis at least once. I used to know in 2000 all the doctors who prescribed cannabis in Canada. There was about five of them. So to go from five doctors to 18,000, which is about 20% of all physicians in Canada, is a remarkable increase. Now, in October 17th of last year, of 2018, we legalized the adult use of cannabis. Uh, and so far, that's been an experiment that's been working fairly well. Uh, but at the same time, uh, just recently, we've also regulated different forms of cannabis for patients so that we can have edibles and extracts and vape cartridges as well because until then, we had very limited selection of cannabis products. And on the horizon, I look forward to seeing uh, cannabis available through pharmacies because right now, Tilray ships to all Canadian patients. We mail it directly to patients. You still can't get it in pharmacies, which is ironic because in other jurisdictions where products are available in Germany or in uh, Chile or in all these other countries, it's mostly available through pharmacies, but not in Canada yet. Um, we are involved in 10 different uh, clinical trials right now um, in three countries, in Australia, Canada, and the US. We've got a study of chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting. Uh, that's a phase two, phase three trial with the University of uh, Sydney and the government of New South Wales. Phase two is done on that study, so we're now moving on to phase three. We've got a study of pediatric epilepsy that we did with Sick Kids Hospital. It's the largest children's hospital in Canada, and uh, the results are out. We've got a publication, and we saw significant reductions in seizure frequency as well as seizure uh, 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 severity. We did a study of uh, post-traumatic stress disorder that's ongoing at the University of British Columbia. We did a study of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, uh, at McGill University, and that led to a publication. We've got an ongoing study of essential tremor at the University of California, San Diego, uh, and a, a study of children with intellectual disability with a focus on autism. We heard a little bit about uh, the use of cannabis and autism earlier uh, today, and uh, so we're doing a study on that. It's already done, the first phase of the study, and we hope to have a publication by the end of the year. And finally, uh, we've got a couple of studies on alcohol use disorder, one on alcohol use disorder, one on alcohol use disorder and PTSD at New York University in the U.S. And re recently, just last week, announced a study of taxane-induced peripheral neuropathy at Columbia University. That's looking at one of the side effects of chemotherapy for women with breast cancer. And of course, if you can keep people on treatment uh, for breast cancer, then you can actually save lives. So we're hopeful that cannabis can help deal with some of the pain and peripheral neuropathy that's a side effect of that treatment. This is not just a theoretical research program. We work with academics who publish all of our results. And so far, we've got nine publications associated with our clinical or observational research program. Um, I'm an active medical cannabis researcher. And my f the focus of my research is patient patterns of use and the impact of that use on prescription drugs, but also on alcohol, tobacco, and illicit substances. And uh, I'm the primary investigator in all three of these studies. Every two years, we do a large patient survey in Canada. It's always the largest survey of Canadians to date. And we did it this year in January. We're writing up the publications, the results of that study. 
And today, I'm going to share the results of the Tilray Observational Patient Study. As I mentioned, it's a large prospect of study of Canadian patients. And more recently, we launched a study of medical cannabis in older patients because older patients are the fastest growing group of patients, not just in Canada right now, but around the world. I think older patients are tired of the poly uh, drug approach to aging. They don't want to be given a dozen drugs to deal with all the side effects of the other dozen drugs they're, doing, they're using for pain or autoimmune conditions as they age, and cannabis may be providing some answers or some alternatives to that as well. So the Tilray Observational Patient Survey, this is a very simple study design. I wanted to look at the impact of medical cannabis on quality of life and on prescription drug use. And so I used the, uh, uh, the uh, World Health Organization Quality of Life short form, which is one of the most used and validated quality of life instruments in, uh, in the world. We used a cannabis survey of great detail to find out what kind of cannabis uh, products patients are using, how much they use, how much they use each session that they use, uh, so we can get a very clear view of that. And then we did a prescription drug questionnaire, which is filled out by the physician, by the healthcare provider at each of the study visits, which is baseline before the patients start using Tilray cannabis products, one month, three months, and six months. And the doctor fills out the prescription drug use down to the milligrams per day. So a very detailed uh, 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 collection of what prescription drugs and how much of prescription drugs the patients are using. And here's what we found. We found that this is a largely female population of 57.6% and a very well-educated population with 55% having college or university education. And so what we really find is a lot of very smart women seem to be turning to medical cannabis. And I'm encouraged by this because when I started doing this kind of survey in 2015, only 25% of the people who were using medical cannabis in Canada as part of this program were women. And now we're seeing gender parity. And I think the reason for this is there are a lot of conditions with a higher prevalence in women, like fibromyalgia, MS, lupus, headaches and migraines, anxiety, depression, that don't seem to be well treated by traditional pharmaceuticals, but they do respond well to medical cannabis. In terms of the average age of these patients, it's 51 years old. I think there is, that kind of breaks down some of the stereotypes around who's using medical cannabis. There's still a perception out there that medical cannabis patients are 18-year-old guys. They're sitting in a basement playing video games, doing bong hits, getting a doctor to sign a script uh, in order to legalize the recreational use. And I can tell you after working for 20 years with patients that what I typically see are middle-aged individuals, they've had treatment failures, and they're looking for alternatives to traditional treatments. And certainly here, when you see the average age is 51, it certainly seems to suggest that. In terms of primary symptoms, patients could click multiple boxes in this here. And here what I've got listed is the top 10 primary symptoms. And we see that chronic pain is still king at 80%. So 80% of patients cite chronic pain as at least one of the reasons they use medical cannabis. But that's closely followed by insomnia, anxiety, depression, stress, and headaches. So 6 out of 10 of the primary symptoms are either pain or mental health. And if you work in the healthcare system, or if you're someone with chronic pain, you know those are often comorbidities. That patients with long-term chronic pain sometimes develop stress, anxiety, depression, insomnia. And that patients with long-term mental health conditions sometimes develop pain as a comorbidity as well. We also see a lot of use for spasms, Parkinsonian disease, MS, epilepsy. Uh, we see a lot of use for nausea and appetite loss, sometimes associated with cancer chemotherapy or a side effect of treatment for HIV AIDS or hep C. And we see a lot of GI issues like Crohn's, colitis, IBS, IBD. These are all very common reasons why patients use medical cannabis, not just in Canada, but in the EU, in Australia, in the US. Similar research has shown similar patterns of use all over the world. Um, doctors and physicians and uh, patients often ask me, um, do you, know, do you de develop a tolerance to cannabis treatments? And the good news is that patients typically don't develop a tolerance to the therapeutic effects of cannabis, but they often develop a tolerance to some of the, uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, un undesirable side effects, such as dizziness, disorientation, uh, dry mouth, red eyes. And here what we see is that the amount of flower cannabis being used by these patients at baseline 
uh, and we, we start at one month because we wanted to see the non-naive as well. It's 6.2 grams, less than a gram a week. And by the time you get to six months, it's only gone up to 6.9 grams. It's a non-statistically significant increase. So essentially, the pattern of use when you find the right dose for medical cannabis patients stays the same over extended periods of time. And I know patients who've used cannabis for 10 or 20 years who use far less now than they did when they started as well. So it's not like opioids or some of the other drugs where you sometimes have to keep increasing the dose to get the same therapeutic effect. Uh, I asked patients what their preferred type of cannabis was and also what their primary method of use was. And CBD beat out indica, sativa, and hybrid, which are all high THC variants. And when I asked them primary method of use, oral use, which is oils and capsules, beat out vaporizer, joint, water bong, and vaporizer nail. In other words, it, uh, oral use beat out all of the inhaled uh, uh, options combined. This is the first study I've done in 15 years where CBD beat out THC, oral ingestion beat out inhalation. And I have to tell you, this marks a really significant shift in medical cannabis use. If we were having this conference five years ago and we were talking about medical cannabis, we'd largely be talking about the inhalation of THC products. But more and more when we talk about medical cannabis, we're talking about the oral ingestion of CBD. And I want to show you guys that a lot of these changes have to do with the older patient demographic coming on board. So here in orange, you see THC, and in, CB, in CBDs in blue. And we broke out the, f the uh, preferred or the primary method of use, or the preferred strains used by these, uh, this patient population uh, by age. And at 25 years old, or 25 or younger, you use THC and CBD about equally. But by the time you get above 55, 80% of these patients prefer CBD over THC. Now, it may be that when you're older, you don't want to get the dizziness or the high associated with THC because you don't want to have a fall. Or it could be that CBD is particularly effective at treating autoimmune conditions, arthritis, and that type of inflammatory pain. But for whatever reason, patients at this age seem to do much better on CBD. And when we look at the patterns of use in terms of the method of use, you see the very same data. By 25 and under, patients are overwhelmingly inhaling uh, their cannabis products. And by the time you get over 55, oral ingestion uh, is the preferred way method of ingestion by 75% of patients. So older patients definitely prefer oral ingestion of CBD. And as I mentioned, uh, my main area of research is the impact of cannabis on, on the use of prescription and other drugs. And in this case, in this slide, we're seeing uh, the percentage of patients who are using these six classes of drugs, opioids and non-opioid pain medications, antidepressants, so SSRIs and SNRIs, anti-seizure drugs, benzodiazepines, and sleep aids and muscle relaxants. And this is the percentage who were using at baseline, month zero in orange, and then one month in blue, three months in red, and six months in green. And what we see is a statistically significant reduction in the percentage of patients using all of these classes of drugs between baseline and six months. And when we look specifically at opioids, we see that at the start of the study, 28% of patients were using opioids. By six months, that's down to 11.3% of patients. And we used a formula called the morphine milligram equivalency factor to compare low-grade opioids like codeine to high-grade opioids like OxyContin. And what you see is that the average daily dose of opioids used by these patients was 152 milligrams at baseline. And by six months, it's down to 32.2 milligrams. That's a 78% reduction in overall o opioid dosages as well. So in Canada and in the U.S., we're going through an opioid overdose crisis right now. And this is the kind of information that suggests that cannabis can help deal with some of the challenges of patients using opioids and opioid dependence in our society. Uh, we also saw the same kind of drop in all of the prescription drugs, the classes that we looked at in terms of daily prescription and daily dosages. So in all six of the main classes of drugs that patients use, we saw a statistically significant drop in both the percentage of patients using them and the daily dosages. 
And we wanted to find out what the economic impact of this was because this must be saving money down the end. And what we saw is that the average cost of medication for these patients at six months, was, or at uh, baseline, was $106 per month for all these prescription drugs. And that by uh, six months later, it was $18 per month, an 87% reduction in the overall cost. And when I talked to insurers and talked to governments who were trying to figure out if they should cover the cost of cannabis, this is the kind of information that they're looking for. And at the same time as we saw these drops in the use of prescription drugs, we saw statistically significant improvements in all four facets of quality of life. And the primary changes were seen in physical health with a 26% increase, and then psychological health with a 14% increase. But all four facets of quality of life improved. So it's kind of a simple formula. You've got a, a patient population largely made up of chronic pain and mental health conditions. You introduce medical cannabis in their course of care. Prescription drug use goes down. And at the same time, quality of life improves. So in closing, I'd like to share just a short video of uh, one of uh, Tilray's uh, patients, Braden, uh, and then I look forward to your questions. Thank you. If the, you could start the video, that'd be great. Yesterday, um, Braden was in the pool, and I took a picture of him, just natural, took a picture of him. And I was sitting there thinking to myself, this is the first time Braden's ever swam in a pool unassisted. Prior to cannabis, Braden had been in a pool maybe twice. When Braden was born, he spent six weeks in the NICU. Um, he was on oxygen. Um, he was kind of tiny, had some feeding difficulties. We later found out he had been seizing since birth and he was diagnosed with early infancy onset childhood epilepsy. Braden went from having just infantile spasms and absent seizures to tonic-clonic seizures, partial seizures, um, complex partial seizures. Braden would have up to 100, 150 seizures a day. He takes up to 42 pills a day exact words from his doctor were um, that this VNS implant was the only thing we had left to do for Braden. And this is an implant in his chest that wires up through his vagus nerve and shocks his brain every five minutes, causes vocal cord paralysis, loss of appetite, inconsolable screaming. Um, and that's when we talked about cannabis back in August of 2015. As a parent, I had nothing left to do for my son, and this was it. I knew my son needed cannabis to survive. September 20th, I gave him his first dose at noon, and at 12.42, in the middle of a seizure, his seizure stopped. Braden has had four seizures since the 20th of September, 2015. He's learning how to ride a bike. His brother Dylan actually taught him how to ride rollerblades. He loves to play hockey. He's got life in him now. I'm learning how to be a mom, not a nurse, not a doctor, a mom. And that feels really good. Since Tilray came out with the extracts, it's been a lot easier. Um, it tastes better for Brayden. I don't have to make it myself. Um, and he's had the same response, exact same response to the extracts. I actually promised one of my friends who started me on this journey that I would help another family and I would help another family and I would help whoever I needed to help in my shoes because I never want to see a mom bury their child because of epilepsy. Thanks. So uh, about 12 months after this, um, uh, after this was shot, Tasha, Braden's mother, called me up 
and she wanted to let me know that Brayden had just gone 12 months seizure-free. It was the first time in his life he'd been seizure-free for 12 months. And I want to be clear that not everyone who uses medical cannabis is going to see this kind of dramatic change in their lives, but I never want to underestimate what it means to have a better night's sleep or a day with a little bit less pain in a patient's overall life. Um, so in conclusion, I want to share that medical cannabis is primarily used in the treatment of chronic pain and mental health. The shift from inhalation of high, THC, of high THC to oral ingestion of high CBD is largely mediated by age. Medical cannabis commonly substitute cannabis for other prescription drugs, including opioids, and cannabis may be playing a role in reducing the personal and public health impacts of uh, opioids, benzodiazepines, and other drugs. Thank you so much. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Go ahead, go ahead. Viva Portugal! No. <laughs> Go ahead. So we have some questions in the app, and maybe it's nice to remind that you should choose the name of the speaker. So may we ask uh, Shirin Mohamed to raise the hand? Yeah. Did you place questions to this speaker, right? Okay. Okay, so we just want to make sure because the questions d were directed to the last speaker in the app, so just to make it easier and efficient. Please be careful when you're entering your questions into the app. That's it. So we go on the first question. And the first question is, considering pharmaceutical companies were historically the leaders in opposition to cannabis legalization, why align with them now? Shouldn't we be disrupting the industry rather than aligning with it? Sure. You know, I've been, I've been doing this for a long time before we had a cannabis program in Canada. Um, before there was any really industry interest in this. Even back then, you had companies who were producing Marinol uh, and Sesame. So pharmaceutical companies were starting to show interest. And even now, the major pharmaceutical companies like Pfizer and uh, uh, Myers Squibb, etc., they're not developing cannabis-based medicines, but they're all researching ways to work with their endocannabinoid system, either modulate the endocannabinoid system, because it's such a key system in our bodies. I think that my whole goal, my whole uh, mission for the last 20 years have been to increase access uh, to patients for medical cannabis. And I see a role in industry in professionalizing and making accessible uh, products that maybe people would never try otherwise. If you're the mother or the father of a child like Braden with pediatric epilepsy, you don't want to buy your cannabis on the black market. You don't want to buy your cannabis from a recreational dealer. That's just not an option. Uh, if you're a 65-year-old with breast cancer, you may not want to buy your cannabis from a corner store. You want to go to a pharmacy to be able to get your, your medicine. And so from my point of view, I think that there's a role for all types and sizes of business when it comes to medical cannabis uh, uh, production or access or even recreational cannabis. I think that it's important to have big companies who are able to invest in research and product development. And I think it's important to also have small companies out there who can deal with the local population and address local needs and develop innovative products that way as well. And I, of course, also believe that patients should be able ultimately to produce their own medicine. That's what we, those are the rules and regulations we have in Canada uh, if they want to as well. But I think that we have to realize if we don't have traditional pharmaceuticals making products available in pharmacies, we're limiting access to hundreds of thousands of patients who can benefit from this. So I think it's important to make sure that access is at multiple points and that access ultimately, this is one of my biggest concerns, is paid for by governments uh, and s through uh, public uh, uh, payer systems. And we're seeing that right now in Germany, for example, where they pay for medical cannabis products. In Canada, we're seeing private insurance start p to pay for it. So my goal is to remove obstacles to access, and I think that uh, companies like Tilray can help help do that as well. Thank you, Philip. Thanks. Uh, we have one more question. Uh, yeah, more. Ms. Joanna Vera. Joanna Vera. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, Joanna. Uh, how does cannabis help uh, IBS and GI tract issues? Uh, oh, that's, uh, that's really interesting. It's not my area of specialty, but I've worked with so many patients who had IBS, IBD, and particularly Crohn's, which is such a devastating disease, colitis. Um, our stomach is lined with endocannabinoid receptors, and so my understanding of the science is that basically it, it helps to 
uh, control some of the pathways that cause uh, the discomfort associated with IBS, IBD, uh, Crohn's colitis, and it seems to be very successful, particularly as an orally ingested products. I know people who've benefited from inhalation, but I think that the oral ingestion, because it comes into direct contact with those endocannabinoid receptors, uh, seems to be working particularly well. And when it comes to some of these conditions, I've definitely seen it uh, change lives. I don't know if any of the uh, presenters are going to be touching a little bit more on the specifics of the science, but I'm easy to reach at philippe at tilray.ca and if ever you want to see publications uh, on anything that I talked about, don't hesitate to reach out to me and I'm happy to send you the publications. Thanks for the question. One more. Okay. One more question from, uh, I don't see the name there. No, we don't have, we just okay. got this last question. nameless anonymous questionnaire. Mm -hmm. uh, the question involves with the, the global movement towards CBD and hemp-based products. Mm -hmm. Do you, is, do you feel that there will be a movement away from THC because people believe that CBD is a cure-all or a panacea to all ailments? I have seen so much enthusiasm for CBD, and it's not just from patients. It's from pharmacists and physicians who say, finally, a cannabis product that doesn't get you high. This must be it. This is perfect. We no longer have to worry about THC. We have CBD, and that is, I feel, a big mistake. I think that CBD is going to pr prove to be very effective in conditions like seizure disorder. There's a lot of promise uh, of CBD in the treatment of mental health conditions, maybe anxiety, uh, perhaps even uh, uh, other me mental health conditions as well, maybe even psychosis or schizophrenia down the road. Um, uh, but when it comes to what we know about cannabinoids as a medicine. We have so much more research so far on THC. THC is more analgesic than CBD, uh, and it has a lot of therapeutic effects in terms of anti-nausea properties, appetite-stimulating uh, properties that CBD does not. So, and what we're learning more and more is that a lot of the time, even CBD-based medications do better with a little bit of THC. So Tilray did a study on pediatric epilepsy, and we used 100 milligrams of CBD per milliliter and two milligrams of THC. So the THC, uh, we included it in our pediatric epilepsy study because parents told us that a little bit of CBD helped efficacy. So I'm excited to see CBD become more widely available, but I have fears that policymakers and, and physicians and pharmacists are gonna say we no longer need THC, and I think that would be a real uh, disaster. So I wanna see both move forward together. Thank you so much. Thanks again. Yeah. Yeah. One more, one more, one yeah, more, yeah, one okay. more, one more. <laughs> I just followed the orders. Yeah, okay, yeah, no so problem. in a world where consumers are increasingly avoiding to become patients through industrial hemp, cannabis-based foods and supplements, oh, <laughs> it, it died. <laughs> Can we respond with this question here? Sure, what it is? Uh, muito boa tarde. Uh, queria, o meu nome é Luís Oliveira. Um, name, Luis? e eu represento uh, uma associação que é a Associação de Apoio a Doentes Depressivos e Bipolares. Portanto, sou neuropsicólogo e, e membro aqui também do Conselho um, e dirigente da instituição. Um, eu não tenho dúvidas nenhumas sobre, digamos, uh, os benefícios da cannabis não só em termos medicinais, em diversas patologias, mas também um, do, 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 do impacto social, não é? porque há muito consumo que é feito uh, em bairros, como foi falado, e que depois vem disputar até outros consumos. Uh, eu tenho duas filhas e, e preferia mesmo que elas um dia, quando quisessem consumir, fossem um coffee shop, mas uh, pronto. Agora, a minha questão aqui é uma questão, eu estudo a investiga a tomada de decisão e, e a doença bipolar e a minha questão é, a minha preocupação aqui tem a ver com uh, a habituação e com a possibilidade uh, de, na, em doenças mentais crónicas como a doença bipolar e a depressão e a esquizofrenia poder potencializar estados psicóticos e agravar o, o, digamos, a, a doença. Uh, se me puder esclarecer em relação a algum tipo de estudo, depois também gostava de falar consigo no fim. Vou pedir, vou pedir, uh, ok, so I had to translate okay. briefly, let me just check. A questão é a adição e a possibilidade de potenciar essas doenças, correto? 
a possibilidade da adição e de, poten de potenciar essas doenças, correto? Ok, yeah. The, so, what I can tell you is, so, so, is it um, dangerous that maybe it tends, it, it gets addicted mm -hmm. and you get schizophrenia, bipolar and you know, okay. potential. Uh, let me, uh, so the question is, uh, what are the risks of addiction and what are the risks of psychosis, if I understood it correctly, about uh, medical cannabis? So we don't have a lot of data on the risk of addiction for medical cannabis, but we know through the literature that the risk of dependence on cannabis from recreational users is estimated to be at about 9%. So about 9% of regular cannabis users, non-medical, uh, will develop some form of dependence on cannabis. The good news is that that dependence is considered mild and short-lived. So it lasts three to 10 days if you cut off cannabis users. Um, and it, it, through that three to 10 days, it can be very uncomfortable. I mean, you can have uh, uh, impacts on sleep. You get uh, flooded with dreams because cannabis users tend not to remember their dreams. You have uh, loss of appetite and you can have irritation for seven to 10 days. But the majority of people who develop a cannabis dependence are able to leave cannabis use without having to go through treatment. And of course, in places like Portugal and in Canada, where we've modernized our laws, those who do need help are able to seek help without having a fear of arrest and prosecution. So congratulations to Portugal, Portugal for having a progressive drug policy all of these years. Agreed. <laughs> Portugal has been leading the way in terms of uh, public health uh, 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 strategies to deal with addiction. The second question was about psychosis, and I just want to answer quickly. The r there is a link between THC and psychosis. So the link is that if you have a predisposition for psychosis, if you have a family history of psychosis or schizophrenia, it can uh, precipitate an earlier expression of that psychosis. It can cause a psychotic break. If you have no risk of psychosis, if you have no predisposition for psychosis, THC will not lead you into psychosis. It's not causal, it's an association. Now. People say cannabis and psychosis, and that's just wrong because CBD is not associated with psychosis at all. In fact, CBD is being researched as a treatment for anxiety, a treatment for depression, uh, and a treatment uh, for schizophrenia. And so right now, people are looking at CBD as a potential treatment for mental health conditions. Ironically, they're also looking at CBD as a treatment for cannabis dependence as well. So we have to be careful when we say cannabis does this or cannabis does that to be sure we're talking about THC or CBD. Thank you so much for the question. I Thank you for your you time. I I'm sorry. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, so sure. uh, <laughs> in a world where consumers are increasingly avoiding to become patients throughout industrial hemp cannabis-based foods and supplements, mm -hmm. is the medical cannabis affected by this particular consumer's behavior? Finally. Oh, I, I, th I think it's great. I think that there's a wide range of use of cannabis products from purely medical. You look at Braden, you know, needs high CBD medication. He's not going to find that out of a supplement that you get out of a corner store, and he's not going to find that from a black market dealer. To purely recreational, people who just want a high THC product to get high. In between purely medical and purely recreational is a big wellness space. And there's people who just find that after a day's work, it helps to relax you. CBD may help reduce your anxiety. It may be something that helps you deal with the conditions of aging ultimately. And I think that that wellness space is going to be a very important space when it comes to the development of CBD and even low THC cannabis products. And I think that more and more, once the quality improves and people know what they're using, that's going to be an important space. The challenge is that right now, in the European Union and in Canada and the US, the products that are CBD that are not being made through authorized producers have been shown to be really, really problematic. And I think tomorrow, well, tomorrow we're going to get a presentation from uh, Arno Hazekamp. You guys, I, I don't know how many people will, will have a chance to see it here, but pardon me? Oh, it's in Porto? So if you go to Porto, you'll see the presentation. The challenge is that research has shown that these CBD products oftentimes don't contain any CBD at all. And sometimes they contain high levels of THC. And sometimes they contain high, high levels of heavy metals. And sometimes they even contain polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. So until we regulate the production of CBD in a way that ensures end users that they're using a safe, 
consistent, high-quality product, we're never going to get to see the benefits of CBD. But I do think that it's an emerging market. In Europe, uh, it was $300 million in sales of CBD last year. I just wish that as consumers, we knew more what we're getting. And I hope that the regulations will help move it forward so we all know we're not getting THC if we don't want it, and we're getting the right amount of CBD that we're looking for. Okay. I'm not going to say it now, yeah? No, no, that's Thank fine you very now. much. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.